Our next speaker is a true champion of community engagement, especially when it comes to exploring local solutions for reducing poverty. Paul Bourne is the president and co-founder of the Tamarack Institute. Tamarack is a leading organization in Canada that helps communities to collaborate, innovate, and make collective impacts on complex issues. Tamarack has helped to reduce the impact of po poverty for more than 200,000 Canadians through their sponsorship of the Vibrant Communities Initiative. Vibrant Communities is active in over 55 cities, including 22 here in Ontario. It is a groundbreaking initiative. Vibrant Communities uses community dialogue to map both the risks and assets in a community and then develop a multi-sector action plan to reduce poverty and promote well-being. In fact, Paul and Tamarack are working closely with my ministry, Ontario's Treasury Board Secretariat, to help with our public engagement demonstration project around Ontario's poverty reduction strategy. Through this demo demonstration project, we're testing fresh approaches to public engagement. Tamarack is helping us to work with community leaders across the province to identify needs and gaps and help us better align our approaches and find common ground in our efforts to fight poverty. And this will most definitely help inform Ontario's poverty reduction strategy efforts in measuring our progress. And the demonstration project itself will help to further inform Ontario's new public engagement framework. I am very happy to be working with Paul on this and delighted that he's one of our keynote speakers today, as I know he'll have some amazing insights to share with you all. He's an author of four books. Paul is also a dynamic speaker. He loves the power of stories. He's deeply curious about and engaged in ideas that cause people to work together for the common good. And he views the dialogue process as just the beginning of learning from and with one another. So here to talk to us about how open dialogue and open data can work together to transform community engagement, please welcome Paul Bourne. Thanks, Deb. It, uh, it's wonderful being introduced by you. You know, the, um, the first time that uh, I heard the name Deb Matthews, and of course she's now had such a beautiful career, um, was, oh, I don't know how many years ago, but it, it started like this. There was a voicemail on my, on my machine, and it went something like, Paul, it's Deb Matthews from London. I got home late last night, uh, I'm lying in bed, and I'm watching CPAC. So who does that? Gets home from a late meeting and sits down and watches CPAC, right? And she said, and I saw you speaking, and there was an idea in there that I really liked. Can I talk to you about it? So it just shows you the kind of person um, that Deb Matthews is and the, the commitment she has to this work. I'm also from Waterloo, uh, like Tom. Tom Jenkins, and Waterloo is the home of David Johnston, uh, the uh, Governor General. And David's known for two things, and this kind of maybe frames that this, my talk is going to be quite different than his. He was known for one thing, he, he developed the tech park in Waterloo. So he's, he's actually named after this big tech park, and Tom Jenkins' offices are inside of that tech park as part of the University of Waterloo. But he also started a, uh, an award program called Barn Razor, which is based on the old order Mennonites. When a, a barn burns down, they don't carry insurance, and they get together and they rebuild these beautiful barns for each other. Well, just to give you a sense of how my talk will be quite different than his, remember that story of the donkey and that poor father and son who lost that donkey? Well, the Old Order Mennonites, 
would operate something like this. These, the father and the son would walk home and people would stop what they were doing and they would talk to them and they would console them. Then they would all get on their horse and buggies and they would drive down to the river and they would pull out that poor donkey and put it on the, on, on the buggy and give it a proper burial. Then they would go back to one of the old order Mennonite homes and they would eat pie. And they would console the father and the son. And before they would go home, they would all take up a collection. And they would help that father and son buy a new donkey. And the story would go on. And what's the business moral of that story? There is none. This is about community. So with that, let me talk about dialogue and deliberation in the context of community. And I really can't see you, but how many of you in the audience come from the community sector, meaning that you work for a charity or not-for-profit. Do we have any hands? Anyone? Maybe if you yelled out, I can't see with the lights shining at me. We have a few. Wonderful. I'm here to share that perspective and to bring some insight on how we might work together differently. But let me start with a story. Several years ago, our, our organization was involved in the work of reconciliation in Northern Ireland. And we would bring 10 uh, young people involved in the IRA and 10 people involved in the UFF. Um, and we would bring them here to Canada and the um, people from Belle Isle of Newfoundland who were part of our, our area in uh, Waterloo, Cambridge area, would take them in and we would do job training with them and all kinds of reconciliation training. One day I get a call from the, 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 the uh, Prime Minister of, of Northern Ireland and she asks to come visit the project. We had become the largest provider of reconciliation training in the world. And um, we said, Let's, I, we need to check. We can't say yes, we learned that already. So we checked with the UFF, we checked with the IRA, the IRA said yes, the UFF said no. So we called the Prime Minister and said, they told us if you come, they're gonna blow up this agency and we take that seriously, so you can't come. Well, our board was kind of pissed by this and said, like really, do we have to put up with this? You know, how long are we gonna be doing this? We have our own problems here in Canada. We started as a small program and this has become huge. The government finding that we were getting cold feet invited us to Northern Ireland to learn about the troubles. We went there um, and uh, after a sleepless night, ended up going to a place called Brookfield in Belfast. Now Brookfield is where it, at the height of the troubles. Matter of fact, as you drive into Brookfield, on one side of the street um, are the Protestants and the other the Catholics. And they built a wall on either side of the street that's about 20 feet high, just above the roof line, because people were getting up on the roofs and shooting down at one another. This is where this community center was built, and it was built in an old flax mill. We got to the community center and we met Father Miles Cavanaugh. He was quite busy, and he sent us off with some community members, and we went looking in the community. They had built an entire business trade center. They had a college. They had a community theater. Uh, they had built a mall because the people there had not been able to go shopping, would have to drive a long way. And they got the mall uh, financing by getting the IRA and the UFF to, to sign a labor agreement not to blow up the grocery store for five years as long as these certain hiring conditions were met. Right? They built a health center. And all that time, these community members were talking about their role and their process in how this came together. At noon, we came back to the community center and there we met with Father Miles Cavanaugh and we had a lovely lunch together. As we were eating this lunch, Father Miles Cavanaugh was going on and on about the work of this community and the troubles that were unfolding and how they had broken through um, the, to, to create this incredible organization. At one point, I, I interrupted him, and I remember this very clearly because he spoke so fast, and I, I said, Father, this place is amazing. And, and get, having a sense that he was going to get a compliment, he sat back in his chair and waited for it. 
It's just a lovely moment. And I said, Father, this place is just amazing. How did you do it? In the midst of all of the troubles that are here, in the midst of all the reasons why this shouldn't work, why has it worked so well? Well, he looked around the table, knowingly at the people who had built this with him, and he smiled. And then he said something that forever changed me. He said, Paul, we listened and we gained a corner on the obvious. We listened and we gained a corner on the obvious. This one line so compelled me it became the inspiration for me writing a book called Community Conversations. This simple book has struck a chord so much so that it became a Canadian bestseller. Why? It is actually quite a dull book and a very dry topic. But my best guess is because the idea of listening to your community and responding to their needs leads to citizen action. And in turn, this citizen action unintentionally dethrones the role of government and the role it was playing in our sector. You see, as a community sector, we had lived on government grants for a long time. And in turn, we continually sought permission from government about what work we would do. If government would fund us, our idea was validated. Eventually, we stopped hunting. We were domesticated and became content waiting for government to feed us. Not just with money, but also programs. And every time they rolled out a new program, in turn, the government told us which ideas we should be working on. The book Community Conversations was but a small voice in a much larger movement of community organizations taking back the agendas on their of their communities. Citizen-led collaboration and now the collective impact movement exemplifies this intent. Let me tell you a story of this work in action. Vibrant Community started in 2002 inspired by a citizen-led initiative I founded called Opportunities 2000. The goal of that initiative was to rally our community from 1996 to 2000 to move Waterloo from the second lowest level of poverty to the lowest level of poverty in Canada, which we succeeded in doing. Today, 57 cities, 21 from Ontario, have adopted the framework for change we created. And next week, 350 people are meeting at a gathering called Cities Reducing Poverty When Mayors Lead, just to give you a sense of how this has caught on. Key mayors, including Calgary Mayor Nahid Nenshi, Canada's hottest new mayor of Edmonton, Don Iveson, and also Deputy Mayor of Canada's largest city, Toronto's Pam McConnell, will be presenting. Brock Carlton, Director of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, will be moderating. And gathering will be some of the finest organizations in our country. What do these cities have in common? First, they have all developed comprehensive poverty reduction strategies that came out of, on average, a year of dialogue and deliberation with their communities. They reached out to business leaders, all levels of government, the community sector, and most importantly, people living in poverty. They studied data, and they, and they debated it. They didn't just read it, they debated it. They agreed on measures to understand poverty and set shared performance measures for the outcomes that would reduce it. The gathering of ideas and the debate between citizens about what should be done to reduce poverty has resulted not only in better solutions, but also engages people and it strengthens commitment to work together on these solutions, a vital, agreement, a vital ingredient in collaboration. The poverty reduction strategy developed through debate, storytelling, and collective number crunching is now a community's common agenda, and it becomes a shared measurement system. 
allowing multi-sector organizations to engage in what we've come to call mutually reinforcing activities. The deep connection, trust, common understanding, and shared measurement system moves collaboration from simple coordination to, way, to a way of working that produces a collective impact and in turn, better outcomes. To sustain the work of collective impact, cities develop complex, continuous communication networks. We've heard so much about that today, but it works in a very dynamic and organic way in communities. And there's a role for media, there's a role for social media, there's a role for technology, but there's a real role as well for face-to-face -face gatherings. And they develop a unique jointly owned governance structure that has become known as the backbone organization. And all of these backbone organizations are fully staffed. So we have staffing that run, the, that help to support this ongoing dialogue, this ongoing planning, and this ongoing action. Well over 250,000 families have now benefited from this work and are less poor. Many have moved out of poverty. But the work has just begun. Already this network has committed to move one million families out of poverty by 2020. In Ontario, Tamarack and vibrant communities through the encouragement of Deb Matthews and her team has partnered with the provincial government to open dialogue between cities reducing poverty and the province of Ontario. Now our joint objective is first of all to help cities better understand the provincial poverty reduction strategy and to learn together how we can make this strategy successful. Now interestingly enough that didn't that wasn't the ask of the province that was our ask to the province. The cities are saying like we all have poverty reduction strategies if you're successful we're successful we need you to be successful so we can be successful. So there's a really a joint interest in this partnership and thus our co-objective is then for the province to better understand the city poverty reduction strategies. We both have poverty reduction strategies in common and to learn together how we can make these strategies more successful. A final objective is to understand the data needed to understand the success of our strategies and to make available to the cities the data they need to make better decisions and manage. We talked earlier and there was a great question about the buying of data we currently spend $25,000 a year, and I know it doesn't sound like a lot of money, but it's a lot of money to us as a community organization, buying data from Stats Canada so that our cities have a better understanding of the poverty in their communities. It seems ludicrous to me that we need to do that. And we want to talk about that, and we've agreed to talk about that, and to see how we can actually understand the data that cities need, and then figure out how we provide them. So far, we're just beginning. We've developed a terms of reference. We've opened a dialogue and surveyed 36 cities to see their interest and to get some base information from them and to get their commitment to come to a gathering that Minister Matthews will be convening, a one-day learning forum that will deepen this conversation and most importantly, strengthen trust. And ultimately, we hope to build that trust so that we're committed to each other's success and also to really and deeply understand how we might measure what's going on and learn from one another. Already our cities have created a joint poverty reduction measuring strategy. Why does this matter? Well, the issues like poverty that are facing our communities are complex. Yet many of our solutions are simple. Like poverty, a complex issue has many interconnected causes. The issues are seldom generic. Problems show up differently for people based on their circumstance and often geography. What makes complex problems like poverty even more difficult to solve is that these problems keep adapting, both at the micro, people change, and at the macro, such as an economic downturn. But when we deploy simple solutions such as government programs that are equal and measurable and centrally controlled, we operate as if we understand the issue of poverty everywhere. And we start to simplify solutions based on long held and often old theories of change. Then we add bureaucrats, often 10 levels deep, and then we wonder why our results are what they are. 
which on the issue of poverty are not stellar. When we operate as if a complex issue is simple, we come up with easy to understand programs like food banks, soup kitchens, job search programs, and the latest darling, the basic guaranteed income. Open dialogue and open data provides us the opportunity to reach out and act in new ways, to get as close to the people and issue as possible, to share what we know and hear what we do not know, to deliberate in the messiness of the issue and to find a solution we all think might work. The future needs good government and good government needs good community. And most importantly, we need the resilient, engaged citizens that live there. Together, we need to share good information, both qualitative and quantitative. We need effective ways to consult on issues and be open to consultation being messy and vulnerable and real. We need to be willing to deliberate human to human, to argue. Maybe the machines won't like it, but we're gonna argue amongst ourselves anyway. To be curious, we're gonna be so curious I don't think a machine can be that. To get lost together. I know a machine would call that bad. And to find a compromise solution that is seen as wise by the whole. Then and only then can we collaborate and innovate together. This, I believe, is what Father Miles Kavanaugh meant when he said we listened and we gained a corner on the obvious. Thank you. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, you gave us lots to uh, lots of food for thought. Um, we're going to take the white chairs here and uh, ask for your questions and comments and advice. Um, I do want to make a little comment about that. I know many of you here are um, public servants, and I'm. I know that some of you feel like you have to be careful about what questions you ask because of the positions that you hold. And I want to, you to know that this is an entirely safe space. And feel free, please, I encourage you to ask questions that you're not sure you should be asking. So everything you were afraid to ask, everything you wanted to know, but were afraid to ask, now is the time. So I'll take my seat and look forward to questions, the microphones. Oh, we actually have somebody. Yay. <laughs> Hi there, Jennifer Demers from ESDC. First of all, Paul, I'd like to thank you for your remarks. I really appreciated the authenticity of what you had to say. It was really nice to hear. Um, I work in engagement for the federal government, and my question for you, and obviously for you as well, is there are certain areas like poverty that transcend one level of government. Do you have some advice you can give in terms of collaborating with all the different levels to achieve a positive oh. end. You know, we've been working so hard. Under, remember Paul Martin? That was before the desert. <laughs> Ten-year desert. Right? Social Development Canada. So hopeful, huh? And uh, you know that they had a team of seven people just working at that. And they were running all of these um, events that was trying to do look at at horizontality, both at the community level, but also at the federal level. A and, um, you know, we've had a lot of experiments, right? You know, the Prince George Agreement, the Vancouver Agreement. Um, and we've, we've been trying to figure out better ways of, of pooling, not only uh, federal, uh, across federal departments, but we've also looked at pooling federal, provincial, and municipal funding envelopes around certain social issues. The down south east side is a great, is a great um, example of Vancouver because there you would have all levels of government investing heavily and not making a lot of progress. And so the way that they figured that they would start to collaborate is they would start to figure out could they align their funding portfolios and then fund jointly what needed to be funded. Just one idea. But I think most importantly, there seemed to be an incredible interest. Three, four hundred people would show up at these consultations, these noon hour gatherings, where we would talk about horizontality and try to just get federal departments talking to one another um, here. 
and, and actually saying, how do we show up in community? Okay, now, how do communities perceive us if we all show up like that? Can we show up in a more joint way, right, and come up with a better joint solution? Now, that was the time when the federal government actually mattered. Nobody bid on that one? <laughs> it will matter again, trust me. So I, of course, have lots to say on that, but I'm not going to because this is the Paul Bourne Show. <laughs> and um, we'll move over to the next microphone. Yes. Uh, congratulations on your speech. It's really good. I read the op-ed in Ottawa Citizen, I guess Monday, by the two co-chairs of this conference. It was wonderful, and it talked about Tamarack. I'm Mary Lou Levisky. I'm from Ottawa, and I've been doing some work um, trying to improve pretty well on my own, not because they're, well, anyway, on my own for the last six months. And it's very frustrating. And how do you get your mayor on side? And how do mayors decide if they're going to be there or not? D d d does council sit around and say, should you participate or should you not? Or is it an individual thing by the mayor? And I'd love to see our mayor involved. And Here how in Ottawa? In, uh, pardon me? In Ottawa? Yeah. Yeah, but he's, he's pretty involved in the homelessness issue. He just isn't involved yet in your poverty roundtable the way we would like him to be. But let's just wait a few months. Okay, I want to say one thing on homelessness. I heard this while I'm trying to get bed bugs and cockroaches out of yeah. um, Ottawa community housing and other low rentals. In Ottawa, they have a homeless program, which is wonderful. But they're taking people from the mission who are homeless or wherever and bringing them into Ottawa community housing. They're I hate to say this because it's, very, it's going to sound very crass, but they are possibly bringing stuff with them that involves bed bugs and cockroaches. Meanwhile, at our local jail, you can't go to jail unless you're cleaned up. And my point being is I'm not trying to say don't take homeless, but for God's sakes, we shouldn't be infesting, reinfesting. Yeah. There's got to be an answer here somewhere. Let's go back to your first question around mayors. You know, what's interesting today is that you, we don't wait for government. And citizen-led um, empowerment and the collective impact movement is saying that government is but one player. And I think in the whole dialogue and deliberate, this whole dialogue and data and this dialogue and deliberation point is for government to become to recognize that. It's not really a humbling point. They're an extremely important player but they are just one player. That there's a whole citizen group and everyone is important. The mayor is important, but it doesn't mean we can't act if the mayor is not involved. It doesn't mean we can't act if the government is not involved. But ultimately, as my, as my co-founder of Tamarack, Alan Broadbent of the Ivana Capital Corporation would say, ultimately we need government to act. So even if we act as citizen-led, we're always having our eye on the government and engaging them and trying to bring them in. Why? It's because in a democracy in Canada, which is one of the greatest countries in the world to live, government has been established to be the, the voice of the common. It's our voice. It's who we are. It's how we decide to set it up. And I know that sounds so idealistic, and there's a lot of cynical people that might say, hey, that's not so today. But ultimately, that's what we're trying to do, is make that so. And so we bring government in over time, as we need to and as we're able. Doesn't mean we can't act, though. Well, thank you for your poetic presentation. That was, that was really quite beautiful. The question that I have uh, addresses the prerequisites, I think, mm -hmm. to the kind of community involvement that you have somehow managed to create here and you've seen elsewhere. It seems to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that it requires a lot of compassion and willingness to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, how do you encourage communities to offer that up? Or how do you teach that in places where it's not so much seen anymore? Yeah, I, I think it's, kind of, it's innate. And even though we don't see it as much as we would like, it is quite innate. But when we go into a community and we want to employ, and remember we've got a lot of experience at this because we've done this not only in Canada, but we're also working throughout the United States now, um, is that we, we first of all go in and measure the history of collaboration. That's what we first take stock in. Because what we're trying to understand is where have they collaborated before? 
And some communities say, well, we haven't collaborated at all. And then we say, well, the arena was built by a whole group of people, right? And that, that community center was built by a whole group of people. Like, there's a number of things that we find. But in other places, like, I remember at one point we called Victoria, B.C., the collaboration capital of Canada, because they had eight citizen-led collaborations ahead of their poverty reduction one. So gathering people together was actually quite easy, and they knew exactly what we were doing. There was a lot of trained people in citizen-led action and collaboration. Secondly, we look at leadership. Around an issue like poverty, where is there leadership on this issue? Is the mayor involved? You know, are the leading social service organizations involved? Are key government people involved and caring about this work? The third thing that we look at is, is the appetite for the issue itself. And, and we, we start to monitor and measure on any given issue what the public opinion is, but also what the opinion of leaders are to the issue. So obviously, therefore, it's almost like tying into that second one. And lastly, we talk to funders, and we say, what appetite do they have in getting involved? Now, it doesn't mean that if any one of those four are weak, that we can't do a large-scale collaboration. But it does give us a benchmark about where we have to put the most effort in at any given point to take this collaboration to the next level. But, and here's the but, and the really important one, and it really helps us understand what we're doing today. The, the one and most important thing I said today in my speech is that these vibrant communities spend 12 to 18 months in dialogue. Some cities will hold 100 different dialogues. And they won't be on tables like this. They drive people around on buses. They have all kinds of experientials. They've gotten amazingly good at these dialogues. You know, city halls, uh, the city government brings in delegations. And I remember in Hamilton, um, 37 presentations were made to council. It lasted nine and a half hours. And at the end of that, the mayor was so moved that he declared the next week to be the week of learning about poverty. He literally just declared it for the city. City uh, council broke and studied poverty for a week because they said, we just done, didn't know, right? So th this, the role of dialogue is a very, very interesting um, role in terms of mobilizing and bringing people together. Um, Anyway, I could go on and on about that, but thanks for your question. So uh, before I go to the next question, I just want to ask you to um, expand on something. You, in your remarks and elsewhere, have really talked about the power of listening. Uh. And I think as we look at open dialogue as government, we traditionally haven't put in place um, the opportunity to really listen. We pose a question and listen to the answer, but the question is government's question. Mm -hmm. It's not driven mm -hmm. from the needs of individuals. So when, in my work on poverty reduction, I traveled the province, had meetings across the province listening and trying to engage people who actually were living in poverty proved to be difficult. Okay. But when we were successful in getting people who actually had that lived experience, uh, what they had to say was far more powerful mm -hmm. than having the voice of the head of an agency or a, a, a person who worked to help people but wasn't actually ex of that experience themselves. So in terms of framing the question, when, when we're thinking about government being more open in our dialogue, maybe you can talk about the, the importance of getting the right people to actually talk. Mm -hmm and the power of listening? It's a marvelous question. You know, Deb, it's, we, we have all of these wonderful bureaucrats, all the people that work in government, and we limit them. So, I mean, what you did today, and it, it may have sounded all okay, you know, the big cheese is saying you're allowed to speak, right? <laughs> but we need to say that over and over again. Right? And I don't know, I mean, they're incredibly talented people, but their paradigm has been stunted. You come into government and you kind of think that this is the role of government. And the role of government is you can't listen 
because everybody expects you to do something, and they all expect you to fund something. So if you already are listening to everything in that paradigm, how can you hear them? All you're doing is thinking, can I do that? Can't I do that? What's the parameter that I come into? Why are they telling me that? Right? And we all need to chill. It's not just government's fault. It's also the community's fault. We have to somehow start to say, government is one player here. They're important. We get that. But we don't have to rely on government to get this done. We need government to be a partner at the table. Now, if we could actually allow your people to come in as partners, no answers, no funding right now, nothing. We're just here with our talent, with our ideas like everybody else, and let's talk, right? Then let's make sure that all of our conversations are multi-sectoral. That's the key. It's not just about people living in poverty. Actually, I find when people living in poverty are just people living in poverty in the room, I'm no more interested in their conversation than I'm in a room with just business people talking about poverty. But you bring people living in poverty with, together with business people, together with government lead people, together with um, uh, social organizations, and you have large-scale conversations like we do, it's magic. It's magic because we break through these paradigms of who we think we are. And we start to hear stories that are remarkable. The business person who grew up in poverty tells their story to a person living in poverty who thinks the business person would never understand their plight and yet they bond and connect at that moment. And this is really important stuff in terms of the shift we need, and then to get that wisdom and to understand what we're going to invest in. I don't know if that was helpful, but. We, uh, very helpful, in the beginning again of another long conversation. We have room for one more question. Yeah, we have two minutes left. Wonderful, thanks Paul for sharing your experience, very inspiring. Uh, my name is Megan Helster and I'm a former federal public servant up until about uh, three months ago. I'm now working in Toronto with a group called Civic Tech Toronto. Uh, we provide collaborative space for citizens to come together every single week and work on projects that make Toronto, Ontario, and the, the country a better place, often using design, data, and technology. Um, one sort of thing that's always in the back of my mind is, you know, we're talking about these long extended processes, 12 months, 18 months. Um, how do you mo maintain momentum and optimism in the face of these long, processes, these adapting problems that sort of seem to evolve, um, and most importantly, how do you avoid burnout? Because that is something I am seeing, especially with people who are doing this often off the side of their pillows or the side of their desk, if they have one. Um, how, how do you overcome that very fundamental barrier? Nice. I mean, what we recommend to all of our cities, run three to five year campaigns. Hmm. Uh, don't make them ongoing and forever. Have beginnings and ends. Let people shuffle through. Interestingly enough, in our network, we have a hard time getting people off our committees. So we gotta keep moving stuff around. We have all these tricks to get people to move off and move on. Um, it's just interesting that when things are authentic and real and dynamic, um, time is purely the essence of priority. And so how do we make this a priority for people? And we can have a lot of fun having dialogue and deliberation. We can have a lot of fun analyzing data. It doesn't have to be dry. Um, and it can be really meaningful. I think you give people that experience um, and uh, they want to stay with you. Uh, just kind of an interesting paradox. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyway, thank you. Well, we are out of time. Um, thank you so much. You. It's always a pleasure to be with you and to uh, get inspired by you. You uh, are <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all.